State University. Uh, I'm a moderator of uh, this uh, session, and uh, starting uh, of uh, this session, I would uh, pre uh, present a small uh, uh, introduction uh, for our session. Uh, first of all, on the uh, venue, we have uh, five uh, uh, presenters. Uh, each of uh, them uh, have uh, up to 12 minutes for presentation. After that, uh, we'll have uh, one or two uh, questions for clarification, only for cl clarification. And after that, when uh, all speakers uh, uh, present uh, uh, their reports, uh, we'll have opportunity to discuss uh, our most interesting uh, questions. And uh, before this, I would like uh, to present uh, the uh, content frame. Uh, actually, we speak about today uh, on specialized knowledge uh, issues of creation and transfer of uh, uh, specialized uh, uh, knowledge uh, dedicated uh, uh, for uh, uh, conducting of uh, competition uh, policy, competition policy instruments. It's important because uh, this is a factor of uh, uh, efficiency of institutions and as a new uh, as a contemporary uh, economics uh, demonstrates uh, quality institutions uh, of institutions is uh, uh, very important for quality of uh, economic growth uh, for economic development and uh, economic growth and economic development is a uh, sole uh, long-term source of uh, uh, growth of well-being and uh, for this reason, I would like to uh, uh, present some questions uh, around with these questions. With, uh, 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 I would like to discuss uh, uh, issues of knowledge essential for efficient uh, competition policy. Uh, first of all, how do academic uh, institutions address to agenda formation for competition policy? Uh, uh, second uh, question, whether uh, academics, uh, ac ac academicians as an expert are politicians by comparison, or uh, there are uh, simple uh, site observers or evaluators of competition policy. Uh, is it possible to uh, say to some extent uh, that uh, academicians are uh, teachers for uh, politicians? And if yes, in what form? Uh, can we say that academicians and academic institutions have uh, comparative advantages in specific knowledge relevant for competition protection and development? And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, in what terms uh, and uh, in what areas BRICS countries might uh, integrate in uh, knowledge creation and uh, upgrade uh, and uh, uh, upgrade of efficiency of competition policy. And uh, now I would like to present, uh, the, uh, to open the floor uh, for uh, uh, Professor uh, Imran uh, Valodia, uh, Dean Faculty of Commerce, uh, Law and Management uh, with University Republic of uh, South Africa. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you so much. Um, l uh, l let me start by just saying two things. Firstly, uh, you, you can, you can uh, sort of basically attribute everything that I have to say to my academic institution, but what, whatever I say doesn't sort of n n necessarily relate to my, uh, to my role with the... With the, with the uh, with the South African Competition Tribunal. So whatever I say is independent of the tribunal. Um, I should also say that, that my field is economics, so I'm, I'm sort of going to draw uh, on some examples from the economics area, but I, 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 I kind of think that, that the general principles that, I'm, that I'm, I'm kind of going to try to draw out would apply to uh, would apply to the field of economics and and many other fields as well, such as law. Okay, so in kind of trying to think of uh, uh, to to in in uh, trying to think about uh, 
about a way to frame uh, kind of how we could we could sort of talk about the relationship between academic institutions and uh, uh, sort of competition regulators. Um, I think we could we 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 could frame it in two ways. Uh, the first. Is, is kind of really to, to kind of ask the question who should lead and, who, and, and, and kind of who should be, the, who, who, uh, who should be doing the work that, 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 that sort, of, sort of comes after that. And the second way to think about it would be uh, there's been some amount of debate uh, in the last uh, two to three days about, about the role of experts and about the role of independent sort of people. So I'm, I'm wanting to frame, the, uh, frame, frame what I'm going to say uh, along those two lines. But I'm, I, I want to make the case that, that I think both, uh, sort, of both of these, uh, sort of both of these ways about thinking about the problem are not really all that helpful. And, that, um, and, and, and I want to make the case and, and sort, of, sort of give you a few examples that that really academics should both uh, uh, kind of lead this debate uh, and, and that, that there might be good reasons for why they should also sort of uh, follow the debate. And then I'll say, uh, um, I'll say some things about this independence question. So in, in what ways can we can we think about academics uh, uh, being being uh, 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 kind of group that that should be helping uh, that should be helping the authorities to 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 kind of think through some of the issues, and all that I can do in the in the time that I have is to is to sort of get, sort of sort of give you one short example. So in, in much of the work that you would see in, in the uh, uh, kind of in the field of uh, uh, kind of in the field of uh, 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 kind of in the field of uh, 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 competition, you, your, your, your kind of starting premise is, is kind of really always some sort of perfectly com, uh, com, uh, com, uh, competitive market as the as as the benchmark, or the, the the sort of sort of counterfactual that you, you um, that you're using, and you're often thinking about ways in which you 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 you, you, you might move from one situation to the next, and in in m m much of the economics thinking, you you kind of using a standard equilibrium and an, an, an analysis in that. Now it kind of strikes me that in much of the BRICS uh, sort of countries we 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 know for a fact that there that that there are systematic sort of market failures and that this this kind of idea that that markets uh, work uh, sort of doesn't really hold and there's a, a a fair amount of economic theory which would which which is i kind of think fairly accepted which would say the, the the world that we operate in has multiple equilibria, and that and and uh, because our firms don't uh, 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 don't uh, sort of sort of don't really coordinate perfectly, um, many of these equilibria exist out there, and that and and that we have to start thinking about these issues. Now, in in kind of all of the tribunal work that I've seen and much of the economic and, 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 and analysis that would sort of come before the tribunal, I have yet to see anything that would resemble what we know in economic theory is, is, is much of, 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 of what the world that we're, thinking, um, that we're thinking about looks like. So here's one, one sort of example where uh, I kind of do think there's a role for much of the economics uh, 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 kind of academic space to to get get the, the models that we use to be a, a lot more related to the world that we're actually thinking about and 
just to sort of give you, just to sort of give you some sense of, of, of what the theory would say. Here's a, um, um, a sort of typical merger type and, 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 and analysis that you would see. And, and if you're thinking about the multiple equilibria idea, what, what that would essentially say is that if you have a, one firm trying to decide on its output, uh, sort of compared to all of the other firms who would be who who would be on the uh, um, uh, who would be on the horizontal axis? In fact, this firm has three three there's there's kind of three sort of points at which these curves intersect, and there's three uh, 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 there's three market solutions to this problem that we uh, that we would think of as some sort of equilibrium, and. I, 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 I kind of do think that the academic community needs to start making the, the models that we use uh, in the in the sort of sort of policy space a, a lot more uh, uh, relevant to the to the to the markets that we uh, uh, to the markets that um, that we're dealing with. So, moving from that to 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 some thoughts on, on where might the academics do, to, to, to do some work that, that sort of follows on from, from what much of the, uh, of the uh, 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 sort of competition authorities do. Now, it seems to me the real proposition that, 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 that why would we want to have, uh, why would we want to have competition sort of policy at all. It seems to me in the end what we're saying is that it's, it's there to improve, uh, to, to, to sort of basically improve the, the, the levels of efficiency, uh, the levels of efficiency in the economy um, and, and, for, and uh, 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 for us to improve overall welfare. Well, I've yet to see any systematic impact and an analysis that's been done to basically prove this point. So we had some sort of talk in the previous session about the bread uh, about the bread issue in South Africa. So while we have prosecuted uh, sort of sort of companies who've colluded on on kind of bread pricing, we don't really have any systematic and 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 and. and analysis on, on what the impact of that would be. And uh, I think there's a large amount of uh, kind of recent innovation in the economics literature that we as academics should be applying to, 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 to much, of the, much of the decisions made and, and to to, to, to kind of do the work so that we can get systematic evidence on these issues. Um, so le le let me move on now to this uh, kind of question of independence. There's been a fair amount of talk in, in the last few days about what the role of experts is and what the role of, uh, 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 what the role of academics should be. And I'm, I, I, I sort of want you to, to sort of carefully read a, 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 something that was said by, by, by uh, kind of probably the, the sort of biggest name in the economics area. And, and what you sort of to take out of, of sort of Keynes's view on this is that the, 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 the kind of idea that there's some sort of independence in the academic world or that the, 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 the sort of policy um, makers somehow have some sort of truth in the space is, is kind of really not at all a reasonable view to take. So, so sort of Keynes's view is strongly that, that, that many practical men and, and, and sort of uh, sort of uh, sort of 
people in authority uh, to sort of tend to be the slaves of some of 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 uh, 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 sort of tend to be the slaves of some theorist. And I think we 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 kind of have to start from the premise that uh, this is a space that is that that is. Um, messy, that is fluid, and 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 that has a fair amount of of, of sort of sort of contestation about it, um, and I think the authorities could um, could could kind of help in uh, in this process by by by, uh, by by sort of pushing the academic community to to kind of ask m much more kind of sort, sort of sort of deeper questions about what the impact of, of sort of sort of competition law is. And another issue that I think would, would, would kind of help a lot is much of the economics feels really kind of driven by, uh, by uh, uh, kind of access to data. And it strikes me that there's a lot of sort of data in the competition space, which many of the authorities have access to. And, and getting that, that data out there for the, uh, 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 for the academics uh, to, to, to make use of, I think would, 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 would kind of help us substantially to, to sort of build much sort of better bridges between academics uh, uh, and, 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 and those who have to deal with the practical stuff in this space. And um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Valoria. Uh, we have an uh, opportunity to ask uh, one clarifying question. Uh, my clarifying question is uh, related to a uh, quotation from uh, Keynes. Uh, doesn't mean if we, we explicate uh, who's uh, those or these uh, politicians uh, is slave, uh, we might uh, be uh, bet, uh, we might make better the policy. If you uh, clarify that this politician is a slave of uh, of uh, these ideas, uh, we um, and explain uh, 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 whose uh, slaves uh, he is. It means that uh, we might uh, make better the, uh, the policy. Yes or no? So, so my, my sort of sort of point for including the Keynes sort of uh, sort of quote was really to say that 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 I think there's theory and there's ideas on all sides. That that I think as much as academics hold sort of particular views, uh, um, 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 I think it's exactly the case that many sort of, sort of, pop, sort of policy m m m um, um, makers also get driven by those, uh, by those theories. And uh, so I, I kind of think you're right. I think the, the more we, we make these things clear and the, the more uh, the more information there is out there about w w why someone's saying something and what some of the uh, kind of theory behind it, um, I, I kind of do think it would, it, 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 it would make for a, a much more efficient system. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Volodya. And now uh, uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, and to provide uh, a floor for Professor Tuviani, uh, University of Sao Paulo. Uh, please, Alessandra. Hi, I'm deeply honored to be here today to share with you some reflections on the subject of research and support for competition policy, the, the role for BRICS academic institutions. And, well, here is the summary of my presentation. The first point or the first role, uh, I intend to describe the role of Brazilian academic institutions in the competition framework. It's a very concrete uh, description. In the second one, I will try to see the challenges and suggestions on the relationship between academia, competition policy, the, between the academia and the competition policy to the BRICS experience. What can we do 
uh, what, what can we propose here in this meeting for our future? Actually, we are here in, in South Africa, the country of Nelson Mandela, so we need to look for the future. We, we, are, we have to be able to, to look for a, a, a better future. So, uh, the, first, the first point of my presentation here is uh, to describe the Brazilian model. So, uh, basically, the Brazilian model of interaction between the university system and the Brazilian system of competition policy relies on three main axes. First one, how the Brazilian system of competition policy, mainly articulated around its antitrust authority, CADI, uh, is organized to receive academic knowledge. So the competition system receives academic knowledge from outside of it. Uh, the second point of my very brief description is how the Brazilian academic system researches the competition system. So how the university gives knowledge for the competition policy. And the third one, how the academic backgrounds of those who are part of the CAD or the Brazilian competition system shape the competition policy. This is a very important question too, because people are, uh, when they are acting as authorities, they don't forget what they are. They, they still are what they are. So, first point, from the system to the university, um, I, I should uh, bring the, the law because the law defines this model, basically uh, designing our uh, uh, anti -truth, Brazilian anti-truth authority uh, in, with three different internal organs. And the third one is the Department of Economic Studies. So there is the place for this interaction between the competition system and the university system. And basically there we have uh, two ways of uh, this uh, interaction. First one, it's an institutional assistance and the, the other one is a technical updating. The institutional assistance I could resume uh, basically as the activities uh, by which the department uh, supports the commissioners in their hard decisions. And in the second, uh, the second road, is basically a, a vision of the future. How can the authority uh, act in, in a future, in a moment in the future? So basically here we are talking about how can the, the, this department uh, translate all the, uh, the uh, hard economic questions to people like me. Uh, I'm a lawyer, so when I was there, I, it was very hard for me to understand what the economists, what they were saying basically because uh, in the morning they said uh, one thing, but in the afternoon other, other clients, other economists, they were saying other things. As, as you know, Commissioner Paulo, uh, they are uh, very able to, uh, to say that they are uh, making a kind of science, but actually they are not making science. So uh, we really need uh, this uh, kind of translation for, uh, in order to, to achieve a better decision. Uh, so, uh, basically, we can uh, talk about another uh, way of organizing this uh, interaction between uh, CADI and university is when uh, we have uh, requested knowledge, CADI asks for somebody uh, to produce uh, a knowledge or when CADI receives an external knowledge. And we have some uh, institutional arrangements that can allow these uh, this two uh, paths. Basically, we have uh, in the side of requested knowledge, uh, we have some cooperation agreement with other uh, government entities and academic institutions. And I would say just as an example, uh, the National Regulatory Agents for Private Health Insurance and Plans, it's, a, it's an important uh, governmental agent who uh, gave us many important information about their specific markets. When I was a commissioner, I had to use all the database of the, the insurance uh, agents, uh, private insurance agents, to, in order to decide correctly a case, and it came in uh, under uh, an agreement just like that. In, in the other path, we have the external knowledge and we have some interactions uh, with other uh, governmental organs basically based on the treasury uh, uh, department of the ministry 
of Treasure. Uh, the second uh, large pass between I, I, that treat, that deals with this interaction is the from the universe to Kaji. So how is the Brazilian universitary system uh, seen and observing and researching uh, our competition policy? And here I can, uh, I can tell you that uh, it, it was not a question some years ago, and today it is a question. You can see the publication in scientific journals, it's increasing, and uh, it's uh, like a whole picture of, of the country, and the other picture, uh, the graduate work, I could just uh, achieve the data uh, of my own university. So it's not very regular, a very regular, uh, uh, a very regular prediction. But actually, uh, it is a prediction. When we compare with other fields, uh, we we don't uh, see this kind of regularity. So basically, what I can uh, say to you. Uh, and these numbers are showing in some way, is the universitary system in Brazil is researching, is being very concerned about all the competition policies. And it's trying to uh, say these kind of things for the authority. And it's looking for ways of inform how the authorities should, be, uh, should use all this knowledge. Uh, basically, if I could try to make a dialogue with the, 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 the exposition that was before me, here uh, I can uh, tell you that the Brazilian academia tries to tell to the authority how it should deal with some problems and, and try to describe how uh, the authority is dealing with some problems. Well, uh, the, the third uh, uh, point of this interaction is the the, back, the academic background of the people who are in the in in the authority. It's an important question because we have in Brazil some papers and some research uh, basically saying that the the academic background of the commissioners uh, has a, a significant impact on the kind of decisions that we have there. Uh, I can uh, say that it's not, uh, it's not very far, it's not far away from the truth. Uh, we, are, we don't forget who we, we are when we are uh, judging things, okay? We, we are under a law, we are under different facts, but we still are who we are. So uh, that's why it's necessary to understand where people come from, how is this background, what, what, which are the shared, value, shared values in, in these universities or in these academic uh, places. And basically it's important because of the concentration of the, the institutions that uh, provides people, from, uh, people to the Brazilian authority. As we can see, basically uh, we have uh, a very few numbers of schools providing people to the, the competition authority. Uh, we can see uh, in the picture of the, of the right, at least where I, I'm seeing, uh, the, the yellow uh, school background, the yellow part of the, the circle is School of Law of Sao Paulo, my, my university, so we have 12 uh, commissioners uh, coming from uh, this, uh, this specific place. So we are talking uh, about almost half of the, all the commissioners uh, appointed by the government. So uh, certainly the, the, the shared values that these people uh, are experiencing uh, has an impact on the institutional buildings. So for in, uh, specifically talking about this school, we have there a very strong tradition on the rule of law, transparency, and uh, respect for the public, and uh, efficient. So all these values or all these um, shared uh, horizon, it's certainly in, in that institutional building. And uh, this, experience, this very concrete experience, uh, it uh, may be uh, like a, a source for 
our future or for our suggestions for our common future. And in, in uh, regarding to this, I, I've, uh, I've pointed three very brief suggestions for, for our debate. First one, uh, I'm trying actually here to, to build a, a, an arena for our BRICS agenda for the future. Uh, basically, uh, we can talk about establishment of agreements and partnerships between the Brazilian system of competition policy and the Brazilian university systems with institutions from the BRICS, both from the antitrust area and the academic world. So basically we have a space in Brazil at least to learn from you. Uh, it would be uh, uh, an honor to learn from your experience, but it, it, it should be or it could be formalized in one way. The second suggestion for the future is like uh, a creation of a knowledge or information platform of shared competition policies among the BRICS. I know that it will be uh, a suggestion just after me. Uh, I think we can uh, we can go through this path and certainly uh, Brazil can learn with the other countries and the other countries can learn with Brazil and I would say more, all the world can learn with our countries. We, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, I have heard here, uh, I'm afraid of public interest uh, regarding to competition policy. I would say uh, I'm not afraid of public interest. We should think on public interest. So what can the South African experience uh, dealing with public interest and competition policy? What can this experience uh, uh, be uh, useful for the world? How can we uh, learn and how can we teach the, the competition authority around the world? So the third point, uh, is regarding to setting an agenda of common investigations that subordinates competition policies uh, to the national development of the BRICS components. And I, I, I would resume uh, in, in the subject of this conference, inclusive growth being instrumented to the democratization of relations of economic and political power within the BRICS and worldwide. So, Actually here, uh, I'm saying that the competition policy can be more than it is today. We have to deal with uh, very uh, hard, difficult uh, subjects like technological innovation, the banking systems, uh, th subjects basically that the competition policy uh, is not able to, do, to deal with in its day-by-day -day, uh, practice. So, Basically, this is my reflection, and I really want to thank you all. Well, I, I'm lost here in my own presentation. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Professor Taviani. Uh, uh, do you have any uh, clarifying question? Uh, I have one question. Uh, 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 you have spoken about interaction between the universities and uh, CADE. Do you mean that uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, framework uh, uh, agreements or this is agreements based on public procurement of uh, expertise? Uh, what do you mean when you speak about uh, operational interaction between universities and CADE? Well, there are some formal agreements and, but there are uh, a lot of informal uh, cooperation too. It's like the both ways. Uh, sometimes uh, we can, uh, as, as a commissioner, they, they can achieve some knowledge, some requested knowledge uh, through formal agreements, but sometimes when the, the, the case uh, demands, they, it's not rare just to call for somebody that has a paper, uh, a specific paper, and, and ask, hey, uh, what are your, uh, how did you get this number? How did you test this hypothesis? Can you help me here? Uh, so basically, we have this both ways in the Brazilian experience. Uh, am I right that uh, for this work, uh, there is a financial support for this spe uh, special work? To, to answer uh, <laughs> telephone calls? There are 
there is this possibility of uh, having or acting as a financial support for specific questions. Uh, sometimes it's not necessary because of the, the velocity that is demanded. So basically I would say there are th these two ways of solving this problem. Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to uh, provide floor for Professor uh, uh, Wang. Uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Wang Xianlin from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to uh, join this uh, panel discussion. Since my uh, oral English is limited, uh, I will uh, speak in Chinese so as to express uh, my ideas uh, accurately. Uh, I have prepared uh, uh, PPT slides uh, bilingually in English and in Chinese. Uh,关于这个学术机构和竞争执法机构的一个互动啊,也就是关于学术机构怎么能够在竞争政策方面提供一些研究和学术支持的这个问题,我打算结合我所在的这个机构 uh, 来介绍一下中国这方面的一个情况。那么在这方面呢，我想呃从三个方面来进行。那么由于呃学术机构参与竞争政策的这个问题啊，那么涉及到呃中国目前正在推进的一个啊智库建设的问题，所以我想首先来
，尤其是给中央的这个啊主要领导来啊讲课，还有呢，专家到政府部门去任职或者曾经任职的情况。那么在学术方面的研究的途径，主要是发表研究报告啊、专著啊、论文，还有呢啊参加学术会议，还有出版连续性的这种学术研究报告。那么从公众影响的方面来说，主要是在一些媒体上发表成果，以及呢被报道。那么还有呢，在现在的这个网络啊非常发达的情况下，通过建设网站啊、专家博客啊、微博等等等自媒体来传传播这个自己的研究成果，扩大影响。那么从呃，金砖国家的情况来说，我们可能也做了一点比较，但是刚才我们来自啊巴西的这个同行已介绍的情况，我们这里边就可以省去了。那么在中国啊，影响力的这个智库，尤其在经济政策方面的这个智库啊，那么呃，有一些这个可能在国际上也还是有一定影响。那像第二个方面呢，我就着重介绍一下中国的竞争政策研究机构。以及他们对于啊中国的竞争执法机构，包括法院在啊那个制竞争政策的制定和执行过程中发挥的这个作用。那么中国的这个竞争政策，它不像产业政策啊本身重视的比较晚。那么也就是在最近一二十年代的事情，那尤其是在中国啊反垄断法实施以来，也就是七八年。但是在这个啊几年中啊呃。相关的竞争政策研究机构发展还是比较快。呃，目前有大概有三十家左右的竞争政策研究机构，啊，包括啊，比如我们这里边列举了几个，包括我所在的这个机构吧，啊，那么这个都是一边影响的。比如就我们我所在的这个上海交通大学啊，竞争法律与政策研究中心来说，它是呢，呃，建立一个啊跨学科的啊理论研究和这个对策研究相结合。立足于我们这上海，因为上海是上中国最大的城市哈，呃，同时呢，辐射全国啊，特别是对啊中央级的这个竞争执法机构能够发挥啊这个呃、啊、一些呃、啊、作用吧。那么在特别是在去年，也就二零一四年的五月份呢，我所在的这个上海交通大学与国家工商总局啊，就是下面竞争执法局啊，就是签订了专门的合作协议。来共建我们这样的一个中心，那么这样也就意味着我们这个中心从以往可能更加重视的是学术研究，那么逐步的，那么实行是学术研究和对策研究啊并重，那么也意味着我们向这个啊这种智库型基地来转变。那么我们在这个方面呢，呃，是有多种途径来参与的这个啊竞争政策的制定与实施。首先是接受委托，起草这些执法机构他们的部门规章和反垄断的指南。另外呢，包括那个决策咨询课题的这个研究，还有呢，提供对啊、呃、决策部门啊、呃、他们的一个竞争法的培训，特别是竞争执法机构啊、呃、他们官员的这个培训。另外呢，参与重要案件的这个咨询论证呢、啊，并且提供研究报告。还有呢，是参与这个啊、呃，并且提供行业竞争状况的调研报告。呃，再一个就是我们自己创办的有中国竞争法律政策网，那、啊、当然这个目前主要是用中文的，我想以后逐步的，呃，也还要呃开发这个英文的这个网站。那么还有就是我们在去年开始和这个荷兰的有一个啊微科出版公司，他们联合开发了中国的反垄断案例的一个数据库。那么这个数据库呢，它是把中国三家反垄断执法机构和啊各个法院他们所审理的，就是已经定案的这个反垄断的案件，把它的摘要全部翻译成英文，在这个荷兰微科他们这个一个数据库里边公布。那么这个对于国外的这个啊学者啊，特别是不懂中文的这些学者们，研究中国的反垄断的这个情况啊，那么提供了一定的帮助。这是我们这个啊网站的呃呃呃基本的情况。另外呢，从我们最近啊两三年来啊，我们开展工作还是取得了一些啊成果。我这里边呃列举其中的五个啊主要的方面，比如说第一个，我们是从二零一二年开始就接受国家工商总局的委托，来研究起草关于禁止滥用知识产权、排除限制竞争行为的这个规定。那么，作为这个部门规章啊，在今年的四月份已经正式发布，从今年的八月一号开始已经正式实施了。那么，这个我们是全程的参与这个啊
。第二个呢，就是从去年开始接受国家工商总局的委托，啊、呃，研究修改中国的反不让竞争法。因为在中国呢，讲的竞争法它实际上包括两个部分，一个是反垄断法，一个是反不让竞争法。那么反不让竞争法也是由国家工商总局它来牵头来实施的。啊，那么这个呢是二十多年前，一九九三年制定的。那么现在的情况变化很大，那么继续修改。那么我们在这里边承担的研究的任务，那么提供了我们的修改的这个意见报告。呃，第三个方面呢，我们从今年开始呢是接受啊，国家发改委是中国的另外一个反垄断执法机构，那么也是一个中国的宏观的这个局啊，就是政策的制定部门。那、啊、他的委托呢，研究起草滥用之前的反垄断指南。那么这个将来是由国务院反垄断委员会发布。那么从目前的情况来说，我们已经提交了初步的报告。那么经过征求意见呢，整合以后，有可能在明年就正式发布，由国务院反垄断委员会来正式发布。那么还有一个呢，我们是加强呢和我们所在地的，就是上海市的这个反垄断这个机构的合作啊。比如说在今年，我们就接受上海市的有一个叫做《价格监督检查与反垄断局》，那也就是那个。国家发改委系统的，呃，他其实他委托了草拟中国上海自由贸易试验区啊中小企业垄断协议豁免的一个指导意见。那么这个指导意见呢，也在今年发布，在九月二十三号就已经开始实施了。啊，那么再一个呢，就是呃，带有一种啊，就是综合政策研究方面的，就是从去年开始，我们承担了也是上海市。这个啊，价格监督检查与反垄断局的委托，那么研究提交了这样的一个报告，就是关于上海“十三五”期间如何发挥竞争政策作用的一个研究报告。那么这个呢，是希望在啊中国啊，应该是做一些探索突破，因为啊，上海是作为呃中国最大的城市，而且在经济上是处于一个领头羊的一个作用。那么在这个方面的探索，应该是有啊重要意义的。那么第三方面呢，我想就介绍一下中国的竞争政策推动过程中啊啊专家的作用啊专家个人，当然他和他机构是相连一起的。那么这个方面呢是有不同的这个机制，其中一个最主要的一个呃机制就是啊、呃、国务院反垄断委员会专家咨询组。那么这个专家咨询组，它是中国的反垄断法第九条明确规定的啊这样的一个机构，因为考虑到反垄断它的专业性非常强。而我们的专门执法机构也不是所有的人员都有这样良好的背景，那么所以呢，它是成立这样的一个呃决策咨询机构来提供咨询服务。那么这个机构呢，正式成立是在二零一一年的十二月份，那么三年一届，那么现在已经是第二届了。那么这个成员的情况呢，第一届是有二十一位成员，呃，现在呢，第二届的人员减少是十一位，呃，它主要是来自于法律界和经济学界的这些专家。那么在上一届呢，还有一些来自啊行业部门的技术专家。那么按照这个啊《反垄断法》和国务院的相关规定，那么这个专家组的主要职责就是根据国务院反垄断委员会的委托和成员单位的委托需求。那么这个反垄断会一共有十五个成员，那么除了三家执法机构以外，那么还有其他的一些相关单位啊呃部门作为成员。那么是为竞争政策、反垄断指南和规章。市场竞争状况的评估报告、反垄断重大议题和重大的事项、国内外反垄断重点热点的问题提供的咨询意见，啊，那这里边它就是可以发挥作用的地方很多。那么中国在这个方面呃形成的这个呃过程中啊，呃，我们有啊一大批的这个专家学者啊，在这个国家的这个反垄断的这个工作中啊，还是发挥了非常关键的作用。那我这里边列举的是其中的几位，比如说像中国社会科学院的王小叶教授，啊，实际上也参加我们这个会议的对外经济贸易大学的黄荣教授，还有中国政法大学的这个石先忠教授，当然还包括我本人。那么在这个方面，还有这个其他的一些方面的机制，比如说我们现在有一些地方啊啊，陆续成立了竞争法的研究会。呃，其中呢，我们上海市法学会里边就成立了一个竞争法研究会。那么这个研究会呢，是由啊八十多个啊理事成员，那么他们呢是来自于高校，来自于研究机构，来自于啊这个执法机构、法院，还有呢，比如说律师事务所，还有啊一些大的企业，那么共同呢来研讨啊竞争方面的一些学术问题。那么在上海市的这个竞争法研研究会呢，我本人是做啊担任会长。那么除了这个以外啊，我们这个啊
呃临近的浙江省和处于中部地区的湖北省。那么也先后成立了这样的研究会，那么他就是可以把众多的呃对这个方面感兴趣的一些专家学者啊，集中啊集聚在一起，那么共同来研究一些问题。那么最后呢，我想做一点总结啊、呃。那么首先就是说，中国的竞争政策的研究啊，这个起步相对是比较晚的，但是近年来的发展还是很迅速。中国的。啊，竞争的研究机构，它主要集中在大学啊，当然还有一些啊专门的研究机构，但是数量最多的是集中在大学里边。从目前的数量讲，是不断增加。啊，再一个呢，中国的这个啊竞争方面的学术研究机构啊，它是通过多种途径来对竞争政策它的制定和实施发挥啊影响力。呃，那么最后呢，我想再补充一点，就是我们中国的这个竞争研究机构。啊，是愿意和啊啊其他国家和地区的这个相关的这个机构啊，这个同行加强交流合作，特别是金砖国家相关机构的这个交流合作。我觉得我们今天的这种啊研讨、这种交流本身就是一个良好的开端。呃，而且呢，我们啊明天可能有一部分学者可能硬要还到这个开普敦大学，可能做进一步的这个研讨。这是我们相关的研讨的一种延伸。啊、呃，我在这里边啊、呃、来说明啊，就是作为中国的竞争的相关的研究机构，呃，包括我自己所在的这个机构，也愿意来承担啊、呃、这样的一个啊、呃、主办会议的一个工作吧。那么在适当的时候，如果我们有专家愿意，呃、欢迎到中国到上海来参与我们后续的这种研讨交流。那么我的发言到这儿，谢谢大家。Thank you very much, Professor Wang, uh, for an impressive uh, overview of uh, uh, Chinese experience. And before uh, next presentation, I would like to uh, ask one very practical question. You have uh, talked uh, about influence, about uh, influence of uh, think tanks on uh, practical policy, and uh, you are involved in the process of uh, decision making. Uh, can you say that in some cases you have de facto uh, veto right, right of uh, veto uh, for uh, in decision making, and you uh, can influence uh, to stop uh, some decisions as an expert, or no? Formally, is it possible to formally to stop some decisions using a, a veto right?谢谢你这个问题哈，我想对这样的一个问题，我想是从两个方面来说。呃，就我来说，一个呢，就是我纯粹是作为一个啊竞争法领域的一个啊学者，就是专家本身。另外一个呢，就是因为我是担任的，就
呃，实际上带有从学术上把把关的这个这个意思在里边，当然最后的决定都还是他们自己做出。但是在这个过程中呢，我们作为这个啊、呃、专家咨询组的成员，那么发挥的作用，那么相对来说比前面啊、呃、一种纯粹是作为学者个人的身份，那么要大一些。嗯，谢谢。Thank you very much,、uh, Professor Wang.、Uh, next presentation is by、uh, Alexey Ivanov. Uh, Skolko Foundation and uh, uh, High School of Economics, please. Russian Federation. Thank you very much, Andrei. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Uh, I think we have really interesting com conversation here because uh, we touch very important topic: uh, how theories are. Take over decision-making process and what role do they play? And I, I really enjoyed uh, this analogy uh, made by Professor Valodia in the beginning: uh, this master-slave relation, because we are mentally enslaved by some ideas, and you can't uh, just deny it. Uh, how decision-making is uh, going on? Uh, I would use another analogy, maybe uh, less. Uh, I would say. Uh, uh, br uh, less kind of uh, intense, less uh, brutal, uh, but uh, is more related to economics discussion of modern days. This is con competition of platform idea, of platforms idea, which was introduced by uh, Jean Tirol, who got uh, his Nobel Prize sort of for this. And I think com uh, our theories and ideas, they do play a role of two-sided markets. Because on one side, they uh, attract academics who support Support those uh, theories, and then on the other side, they got uh, policymakers who depend on those theories, and being dependent on those theories, they increase the uh, role of those theories and attract more academia. So, like uh, this two sided uh, market where theories play a role of platform, it's really an important notion to keep in mind when we speak about. Uh, let's say, alternatives. I would uh, particularly use this word because alternative in a current context is really a good word um, uh, fitting uh, the forum we uh, talk now and basically fitting the state of affairs in competition uh, law and policy of modern days. Uh, as we know, uh, competition law was created in a period of turbulent uh, years in the United States and uh, in Europe when a society tried to figure out how to balance uh, different elements of the uh, transformative uh, uh, economic development uh, of industrial revolution. And we are uh, coming through another stage of economic transformation, which could be called in different ways, but still we are in a search of uh, new momentum, new uh, resources for growth and development. And uh, for this, we do need, uh, we urgently do need new theories. And this forum, which is called Competition Law and Inclusive Growth, is already giving us a kind of hint of, for understanding where those theories can come from. They can come from understanding of uh, more important role of public of public interest of uh, more complex analysis of the uh, competition law uh, domain uh, through including inequality uh, aspects, uh, including our uh, uh, more broader social impact which competition policy could have. And for this, is extremely uh, important to use the leverage we have, which is called by this abbreviation BRICS, and I know it was introduced by investment bankers to uh, sell you know, emerging market shares to some uh, unqualified maybe investors or qualified investors, I, I'm not sure in this business, but uh, now we can use the same kind of platform for re-establishing and rethinking uh, existing narrative in competition law and policy, and I think it's a great opportunity which we uh, can't miss. If we miss it, we kind of lose uh, a serious momentum for development of um, a law and uh, uh, policy in the competition sphere. And for this, we have an idea how to um, get together and how to strengthen uh, power of all our countries and our academic communities. And I saw uh, brilliant presentations of my colleagues who described how in different countries in Brazil, in uh, China, in South Africa, there is this dialogue is uh, building 
between uh, competition community and academia. And I think we can uh, use this chance to establish a new platform because in a modern world, competition is going on not between products, but between uh, platform standards network. We do need our own two-sided market of theories for which we can establish a stronger academic community and stronger policy-making community. So using uh, this platform. And um, from kind of uh, theoretical position, we actually uh, suggest to move uh, towards uh, to establishing this electronic because we are information technology age, uh, but interactive and based on solid, man, uh, solid academic knowledge and uh, data from BRICS countries, a joint uh, research and uh, policy making platform. And uh, we, uh, as a Russian party, uh, in Russia we have some major institutions involved in uh, competition law and policy development. Here at this stage you have representatives of at least two. It's uh, Moscow State University, represented by Andrei Shastitka, uh, our honored moderator, and uh, I'm representing High School of Economics, which is another uh, social science leading uh, Moscow based university. We are ready to contribute and to support this initiative and share. Uh, our resources, share our knowledge and expertise with our colleagues so that we can show that we can think differently and we can think uh, about our own uh, problems, about our own needs, about our consumers, about particular features of developing countries of uh, our, you know, quite different world to a certain extent, although we uh, share a lot of common values and uh, uh, problems with the developed countries, but still uh, particularity and uh, specificity of our uh, world uh, should be considered and uh, should be established as a feasible uh, base of knowledge. And for this, we also uh, have an idea, have a suggestion to start with a testing field where we can do uh, this work not just uh, through, you know, generalization and uh, theoretization of competition law, but go deep in the, in the most painful area for our countries, for the world, which is actually food. How to feed people, how to develop this market. Market is extremely transformative, and I will uh, give my uh, floor lately, uh, later to Professor uh, Lianas, who is actually a leading investigator in this project, and uh, uh, he will give a bit broader perspective of this. And, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Wang, that you mentioned our meeting in Cape Town, uh, which is, will be devoted to this pilot project, and uh, we hope it will be uh, just beginning of the uh, great uh, cooperation and beautiful friendship, uh, as was uh, said in one uh, famous movie. So the project uh, targeting problems of uh, uh, how food value chain is actually structured along the global value chains and how uh, food production and distribution impacts consumers, employment, all forms of public interest, development, uh, and actually growth and inclusive forms of growth in our countries. Um, uh, the project combines all sorts of uh, political, legal, uh, social, economic implications because we cannot see now this puzzle uh, as a kind of uh, separate element. Uh, it, it should be seen as a complex picture. And that's kind of a new approach we uh, would like to introduce through this uh, shared joint uh, research and development center for BRICS, platform for BRICS. Uh, I just uh, uh, focus on one tiny element and then I finish uh, on this and uh, transfer uh, to Professor Lianos uh, that factor market seed um, uh, as a source for agricultural production is now experiencing dramatic transformation, dramatic transformation which could be, uh, have enormous influence on development of agri-business uh, in our countries, but also should be a source, a food for thought for our policy makers. And it did not become yet uh, such an important uh, issue in our policy debate as it deserved to be. 
I, I watched recently a movie which got prize this year for one of the best documentaries uh, called 10 Billions. Uh, it's like how to feed the world. And uh, one of German researcher, he made a nice uh, very uh, kind of uh, deep analysis of what's going on in uh, food markets. And really, we are facing a problem of uh, how to feed all the people in the planet. And at the same time, all our policies uh, uh, of focusing on innovation, focusing on competition, they completely neglecting and missing out on those uh, important developments which are going on in this market. So that's uh, one of the, just one of the elements uh, of transformative change uh, which we have to consider while developing new paradigm for a competition policy. Uh, we do encourage you to think uh, in a broader picture. We do encourage you to ask questions as Professor Valodia has uh, encouraged in the uh, introductory uh, remarks and first presentation. And I also think that transformative uh, nature of competition policy, which actually was introduced to the, to the legal framework, to political framework, to transform, not to, st to, to stabilize, but to change and balance. It should be also driven by this you know, feeling of staying hungry, staying foolish, as one of the famous entrepreneur and uh, uh, innovation evangelist uh, encouraged us to be. So uh, thank you very much. I, I do think that that's just the beginning. And and uh, BRICS is a proper forum, is a really proper forum for the discussing alternatives, discussing new forms of academic support of competition policy development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for uh, presentation of the platform, uh, for the uh, presentation of the project and uh, also for fulfillment of uh, functions of moderator too. <laughs> uh, and before Yanis' uh, uh, presentation, I would uh, ask uh, one uh, question related to platform. Who are contributors and uh, who is uh, moderator uh, or operator of this pro platform? Thank you, Andrei. Uh, it's just an idea right now it's not an established institution, and as kind of as a platform of modern days, we more see it as a network rather than you know uh, a single entity hierarchically structured with you know uh, uh, leaders and followers. It should be like a group of leaders building together a new base of knowledge, information, research, and so on. So we want to use information technology for this. We are ready to contribute to establishing this information technology thing. So technological part we can make. We are, will be happy if other institutions from other countries would contribute as well, but, but to make first step, we are ready to, to build this technological part of the story. But uh, substantive part should be developed together. And that's what we encourage both our authorities and academic institution to, be, to do. And for authorities, we know that authorities now discussing, and Russian minister who is responsible for competition policy, Igor Artemyev, he made this uh, proposal, he is um, uh, supporting this idea, and he wants other authorities to contribute as well. As I know, South African authority, even in May in Australia, uh, made similar kind of pr proposition which could be considered as we're moving same direction and so if we find support from other authorities and academic institutions that we kind of build a coalition and that's how network is uh, working these days you know that you have academia on one side policy on one side and a platform in a between thank you alexey and as is promised uh, uh, Yanis Lianis, uh, uh, university college of london and high school of economics Please. Thank you very much, Andre, for uh, your introduction. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so, and I heard a lot of interest uh, the uh, presentations of uh, the various uh, BRICS uh, countries' academic uh, representatives, um, and I will speak. Um, as an external observer in the sense that I am not a BRICS national uh, and uh, my uh, uh, affiliation is University College London, but at the same time, I'm also an internal observer in the sense that I am participating, as Alexei 
uh, observed before uh, with this, uh, this new uh, school of economics, uh, higher school of economics in Moscow uh, with regards to this particular uh, project. So uh, Andre started uh, his presentation by asking us to uh, discuss a little bit the links between uh, uh, experts and, uh, and politics. Uh, and when actually he asked that, the first thing that came to my mind were these two quite important uh, articles of, of Max Weber uh, back in 1917 and 1919, uh, um, uh, politics as a vocation and uh, science as a vocation, where basically he uh, very clearly uh, separated uh, the, the two uh, realms. And uh, in a certain way, uh, if we look a little bit to, uh, to the way competition law is, is practiced uh, nowadays, uh, some uh, uh, very qualified authors in the United States have uh, considered that this is a sort of a technocratic exercise uh, in the sense that we are relying uh, very much on experts and what we have seen in the United States uh, and to a certain extent in Europe has been a little bit the isolation of the, this technocratic expertise, uh, this technocratic exercise from the influence of politics. Uh, for instance, in the uh, very recent uh, uh, investigations of the European uh, Commission against Google, there has been, uh, once they were announced, um, there has been a quite a lot of debate among U.S. colleagues on the fact that, uh, you know, I have been interviewed by a couple of American newspapers asking me, is the European Commission politically motivated in order to bring this type of debate and how uh, bad that could be uh, for uh, the competition law enterprise? And in a way, also, the search for uh, international convergence uh, in this particular uh, field uh, with the establishment of institutions like the uh, ICN uh, also tries to promote this idea that antitrust is a technocratic uh, exercise. Um, and in a way, we should somehow um, take it in isolation from, uh, from politics, or at least try to preserve, it, preserve its independence uh, from politics. And obviously, if you take that particular perspective, and I would say that the distinction between technocracy and bureaucracy is very clear. Uh, in technocracy, you know, the, uh, the scientists, the experts, are basically driving the agenda, uh, while, you know, bureaucracy is basically the politicians that drive the agenda, the bureaucrats being basically just there in order to uh, implement uh, the decisions uh, that have been made by, um, um, by the politicians. Now, when I look, however, uh, to the situation in the different BRICS countries, um, I see that, of course, there is this drive towards technocracy in the sense that we are increasingly, and as we have heard before, focusing on uh, establishing uh, a, a, you know, some form of uh, um, uh, academic uh, as well as uh, non-academic uh, knowledge um, on these particular fields uh, with different think tanks and institutions involved. Of course, you know, the important role of economists uh, in competition authorities forms part of that particular, uh, as of that particular uh, project. But at the same time, when we look to the law and we, uh, we look also to the uh, enforcement activity of these different uh, agencies, we also see probably more clearly uh, some political objectives that are there. And some of these political objectives even figure in the, in the law, in the statutes basically that provide uh, the authority uh, to the competition authorities uh, to, and the competence of competition authorities to implement the law. I mean, in, we're in South Africa, you, it's very clear that the South African competition law has this other political objectives about inclusion, integration, uh, but also, you know, the fact that we have, are in a conference called Inclusive uh, Growth, uh, the fact that we are focusing uh, tomorrow on things like inequality, all these things are basically showing that we are taking also a political dimension in the way competition law should be done. And from my perspective as a uh, European scholar, and I will say uh, from a U.S. perspective and more, uh, this is something that we do not really see uh, in our jurisdictions. And from my perspective as well, I will see there some kind of uh, common thread uh, between the different countries that form uh, the BRICS uh, community. Now, um, 
as I said before, uh, you know, we are relying quite a lot on expertise and, and knowledge, and that knowledge doesn't necessarily only come from uh, academic uh, institutions. I mean, we have to uh, understand, and I think this is uh, very much the case in all mature competitional regimes, that a lot of knowledge uh, specific to particular cases is created uh, by a number of actors in the regulatory process. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, consultant economists that are testifying in different cases uh, in front of competition authorities uh, or also uh, the courts. So I would say that we cannot really have this kind of very um, Mertonian, uh, and I'm inspired by Merton, uh, description of science and something being objective and neutral. Uh, in a certain way, uh, we are in an uh, in era where we are becoming a little bit more, we have a lot more plurality in the different interests that are represented and also the scientific contributions that we have uh, might advance particular type of objectives. So we cannot necessarily say that science will be unbiased. So if we take that into account that there might be bias there, we might probably also take a different perspective on how we uh, deal with experts uh, and probably consider that in some circumstances they may act as advocates. For that reason, we might probably need to develop specific mechanisms in order to develop the awareness uh, of the probable biases that these experts might have. And of course, that might come, uh, that might as have as a consequence uh, the uh, transformation of the a legal process uh, in terms of collection and assessment of evidence uh, in competition authorities and courts. So we see more and more often, at least in, in the United States it's very clear, in Europe more, right now the development of uh, admissibility jurisprudence in the sense that some form of economic evidence might be not necessarily taken into account. In the United States you have the, uh, the Dobert rules that uh, uh, fulfill that objective. We also see quite a lot uh, uh, different adjudicatory methods for experts appear, like the hot tub uh, procedure uh, in Australia, which has been uh, uh, transplanted uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the latest uh, reforms of the civil procedure rules in the UK. And I would say uh, this type of reflection um, uh, might be quite interesting as well for uh, the point of view of, um, uh, of the BRICS uh, competition authorities uh, and courts. Uh, as well, uh, but obviously uh, here uh, we'll have also to integrate other forms of knowledge that might be uh, of interest. Now, uh, why competition authorities, they love academics and they try to rely a lot on them in the way we see that, for instance, the ICN, we have a lot of academics, UNCTAD has now a research platform, every international organization is, try, is actually establishing links uh, with academia, and I would say that because that provides a, a legitimacy, of course, uh, to the competition uh, authority uh, in a world in an era of evidence-based uh, policymaking. And I think a crucial issue here will be to broaden up the sources of knowledge and expertise that we have, uh, and uh, that could correspond possibly to the uh, quite special, let's say, uh, regimes, competitional regimes of the Brinks countries, which, as I said before, are not only technocratically driven, but have also these political uh, kind of dimension uh, as well in them, at least at the status and the way competition authorities and courts uh, interpret uh, and implement uh, and apply the law. Uh, so for that reason, I think uh, that uh, Alexei's proposal to establish this joint research center for the BRICS, uh, which would not necessarily going to be a sort of institution, uh, but it could be a, a network that uh, uh, will be open to uh, contributions from uh, different uh, BRICS um, academic uh, institutions as well as consultancies uh, operating uh, in, in BRICS countries, I think uh, that could be uh, a quite fantastic uh, idea uh, to develop. Now, uh, we actually uh, have been working now for a few months uh, on trying to think a little bit of how, you know, the BRICS competition agenda uh, with particular type of, um, in particular type of industries uh, could look like, and uh, the area and the sector we selected was uh, the food industry. Uh, and we did that because, obviously, of the social importance uh, of the food industry 
but as well also because of very important uh, developments and significant changes in the way uh, the food uh, value chain uh, uh, is operating. First, we have quite a lot of farm consolidation and uh, land grabbing uh, that is actually occurring. Uh, nowadays, um, there have been a number of reports uh, by uh, uh, Boston Consulting Group uh, or Pricewaterhouse as well uh, with regards to the evolution uh, of the uh, agricultural markets. And we have seen a quite important increase of farm size the last four decades. Uh, and uh, important purchasers there uh, being uh, private equity firms and sovereign uh, wealth funds. Secondly, we have, of course, global warming that leads to uh, changes, important changes to establish patterns of production. And thirdly, we have a quite important vertical integration uh, of uh, the companies, uh, in particular seed companies like uh, Monsanto, in uh, related uh, markets. For instance, Monsanto has recently acquired Climate Corporation, which is a provider of uh, uh, local weather monitoring and agronomic data modeling and high-resolution weather simulation type of information. And we have seen as well uh, a, a, the evolution, let's say, towards the development uh, of uh, one-stop uh, sub solution uh, to uh, farmers uh, that are offered by, obviously, uh, important uh, seed companies. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, Monsanto being quite present, uh, or, you know, I give this example you know, as one of, uh, of the possible uh, companies that are involved in this particular sector, providing, let's say, uh, some form of insurance, private insurance mechanism to farmers through a pay-for-yield model uh, of uh, insurance that might sometimes replace public uh, insurance uh, uh, methods uh, that are ex already existing, and I think in particular uh, of India, which have their own public one. Uh, and of course, we see the development of new technologies uh, like CRISPR and uh, uh, Talon or FOC1 uh, technologies, which allow genetic scientists to expedite the process of introducing or editing uh, target genes, and in a way also avoid the uh, anti-GMO regulations that we may have in some important markets like that of the European uh, Union. So we see an important transformation uh, of that particular industry um, worldwide and globally. Uh, and obviously, uh, the role of global players uh, is, is quite uh, significant, uh, in particular uh, with regards to agricultural biotechnology and uh, uh, seed-integrated uh, platforms. So, of course, these platforms are, uh, you know, sometimes established for benign reasons, and there's nothing what I say that is kind of a criticism. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, that uh, they might, that might present quite interesting uh, competition uh, uh, aspects, in particular if you take that as being uh, a uh, moving towards platform competition, let's say a one-stop shop solution for farmers, and in a way uh, that might affect the way we apply uh, competition law in this context. Now also, uh, you know, we have quite significant, uh, uh, quite a significant evolution in the uh, uh, in downstream, in the, uh, in the distribution uh, area uh, as well. Of course, there are important differences between uh, BRICS countries with regards to retail. Um, you know, we have, for instance, uh, uh, quite important uh, concentration in uh, markets like uh, in Russia or Brazil, uh, much less uh, in India and China, where uh, you know the um, modern retailers uh, still hold a small share of the food sold on the market compared to traditional uh, grocery stores. Uh, but still, we also see uh, an important number of practices that are business practices that are developed by uh, corporations globally with regards to. Um, uh, the retail sector, uh, private labels, uh, uh, you know, category management, uh, a number of uh, interesting, uh, from the competition perspective, uh, practices that uh, could be of interest uh, for competition authorities to develop, let's say, a common thinking about. So what our project aims to do is basically to uh, look to the whole uh, value chain, so to introduce a concept of a global value chain in a competition law uh, jargon, uh, and obviously to address uh, the uh, interlinkages between the various segments uh, of uh, the chain and try to think about traditional antitrust concepts 
uh, like for instance, relevant market, and how these could fit uh, uh, these new world where uh, this integration, integrated uh, value chains are becoming uh, important. So you can see uh, in this slide some of the uh, additions that say of our project with regards to existing work uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this case. I mean, uh, in this in this uh, sector, uh, the OECD uh, has done quite a lot of work uh, on the retail sector. Uh, but I think uh, there are few uh, studies that have looked to the whole picture of the value uh, chain and its intersection, and this is exactly what we're aiming uh, uh, to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yanis. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, one question <laughs> for clarification. Uh, would you like to ask? Okay, uh, from myself, uh, am I right that uh, when we speak about uh, uh, technocratic uh, regime of competition policy and rejecting uh, this idea, actually we say that it's impossible to import institutions from developed uh, jurisdiction uh, to developing jurisdictions. And for this uh, reason, we have to combine uh, efforts of developing uh, jurisdictions uh, which might be uh, a better fit for uh, discussing of uh, these problems. I obviously agree with, uh, with that remark. Um, uh, le let me clarify also in the sense of what, what academics can do. Um, well, in major difference between, let's say, some of the BRICS uh, competition status and the US or the uh, EU mainstream is, of course, this uh, focus on these political objectives, focus on public interest. And I will note that discussions over public interest have been quite important lately because, of course, of uh, the uh, intervention of different BRICS competition authorities uh, around, I mean, and the importance of their uh, involvement in global antitrust. Um, now, of course, having a lot of objectives uh, to uh, deal with and to try to uh, make trade-offs is a very difficult exercise and it could be quite fatal in case you, don't re you really don't have strong institutions. Um, so, uh, and in a way, you can't really uh, just resolve and say, oh, we can balance the objectives because balancing doesn't really mean, mean much in a certain way. So I think the role of academics in this case will be to develop antitrust law doctrines or competition law doctrines. Let's say think about specific type of practices on the basis, of course, of uh, these different uh, institutional frameworks which are you know, more pluralistic in the sense that they have trying to achieve more uh, uh, different values. Uh, and also taking into account uh, the uh, institutional capacities of the uh, competition authorities and courts uh, or generally, you know, the enforcement system of each particular jurisdiction. And I would say from that perspective, you know, I think we should move away from the debate about goals, should we have them or not, because, that, you know, if the goals are in the law, you can't really necessarily uh, say, well, we don't really look to those goals. We have to, you know, implement basically what uh, the legislature, uh, you know, is, uh, has, you know, set as major uh, goals for, for competition authority. But I, and I think what the focus should be is the what are the doctrines, you know, or uh, more specific doctrines or, you know, institutional frameworks that we can develop in order to achieve these different goals and develop, let's say, some different kind of competition law that what um, we have, let's say, in the EU and the, and the US. Now, that might sound a little bit anti-convergence, but I would consider convergence as being also about information, let's say, about the uh, method of analysis, uh, different practices, so as to um, you know, uh, increase legal certainty, of course, and predictability. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have the same results. Uh, I don't think uh, even the, at the ICN or um, the ACD, they actually uh, uh, think that we should have, I mean, there's a much weaker, let's say, form of conversions that I'm thinking uh, should, should happen here. Yanis, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the time of our uh, session uh, is exhausted. Uh, for this reason, I would like uh, to thank all of uh, presenters for a nice, uh, beautiful uh, contribution and uh, audience for, uh, uh, for participation. And uh, I hope uh, uh, all ideas uh, presented here uh, would be used 
uh, to make our common platform. Thank you very much.